Sisters and siblings, welcome back to Sister Brunch, the podcast that celebrates Black women and gender expansive people thriving in entertainment and media. This is our fifth season of Sister Brunch. So if you're just learning about us, you can see all of our previous episodes listed on Apple or Spotify podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And you can also head to our website, sisterbrunch.com. You can read the transcripts from all of our shows and sign up for our newsletter there. We have another wonderful guest today. We will get to hear their storytelling journey and hear their advice to their younger selves, plus whatever may come up in our conversation as always. So with that, I am so happy to welcome Shay Adebanjo to Sister Brunch. Welcome, Shay. Peace. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm honored you reached out. Absolutely. I, I'm so glad to have found you. Our work is so aligned. Your work is very aligned with Sister Brunch and also all that I do in my productions. So the way we love to start our podcast is to ask our guests to share their journey of whatever brought them here today. So you can go as far back to the ancestors, as far back as you'd like, to tell us what that path about that path that brought you to being here today. So the path that brought me here today is, it was divinely sanctioned, I'll say it like that, mm. right? Because I'm Yoruba by birth and calling. Mm. And so my peoples and myself are from Nigeria, Yes, I have a New York accent that happens. <laughs> so it's like I have a hybrid identity. Mm. I was born in Nigeria okay. and then I got brought to New York. Mm. And so I think there's always that place of in between that exists for me, mm-hmm. not only as my identity in terms of like where I'm from, where I was raised, where I was born, and all those things that overlap, you know what I mean? But also my identity as somebody who's queer and gender diverse. Mm. And so there's like that continuation of the space of the in-between that happens in my life. And sometimes it's an easy place to be and other times it's not Mm -hmm. in this binary world, as you can Mm -hmm. imagine. And so that was part of my journey. And in thinking about in terms of filmmaking, I've always been an activist. Like even my mom was like, back in Nigeria, I would be advocating for things. And (laughs) I'm like, okay, I don't remember, but thank you for telling me. (laughs) And so that's just been my spirit of birth and calling. Mm -hmm. And I actually went to the University of Minnesota, right? This little black body in Minnesota. You can imagine that, right? (laughs) (laughs) And so, (laughs) I know, it's been a journey. So were you out by the time you went there? And actually, if you don't mind, because we talk about the podcast being for black women and gender expansive people, and I feel like when we say that, some folks just turn off their ears when we say the gender expansive part. Do you mind including that in part of your journey if it happened prior to you going to the University of Minnesota? And did it have any connections to you as a filmmaker, you as an artist? There's a little bit of both. So I'll share some. Okay. And whatnot, I was out in New York, okay. out to some folks, but not out publicly, because, mm-hmm. you know, you're 18 years old, mm-hmm. you're still feeling yourself out, you know, finding the language, but I've always knew that I was queer and gender expansive. Mm-hmm. It just was finding the language and being able to be in it, and also have immigrant parents. So right. there's that dichotomy. Yes, <laughs> there's so many, there's so many. Yes. You know what I mean? Yes. And then Nigerian. So like you have to take those things into consideration. And so when I went to the University of Minnesota, I actually was working at a queer youth center in Minneapolis. Okay. And so that was a beautiful space that can just birth me like fully coming out. Mm -hmm. I ended up on the cover of the Lavender Magazine. Oh, nice. Yeah, so that was fun, and then it caused the, I don't know if I could curse, but it caused some problems in my family. Yeah, you Because then it was like... It's public, and so my mom is, what are they going to say? Mm-hmm. Back home. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And it didn't help that they had me on the cover hugged up on a person of whiteness. Mm-hmm. And just, I didn't know well, that's what they were going to use as the picture. Of worms. Yeah, not, <laughs> you got lots of <laughs> explaining like, to do now, right? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm like yes, 18, 19. And mm-hmm. so that was the space where I like fully came out just in terms of naming my identities and still finding the language in terms of the gender fluidity. But for sure, I knew I was queer. I've always it's been queer Mm -hmm. and then that brings me to like how I got into filmmaking Christine Sorensen has 
a nonprofit that does media making in Minneapolis and St. Paul. Mm -hmm. And so she came to District 202 to teach the young folks how to do filmmaking. And at that time, I was also doing HIV AIDS education. And so being able to like make documentaries and learn from her. And mind you, this was back in the day where like your beginning was the beginning. Not like this nonlinear editing we can do Oof. if you wanted to change the middle yep. or the beginning after you got to the middle. That was a whole nother conversation. Mm. So I'm just dating myself, yes. which is okay. Yes, very okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And so like that just really got me, I'll say hooked and got me excited mm. about documentary filmmaking because for me, it was a way that I can reach an audience, I can reach people who were activists and maybe they couldn't get to the protests or be in the front lines. Yes. Right? And there was this way that this story, this sacred storytelling, this organizing, this spirituality can touch people, whether it was from the comfort of their home, a film festival, or a classroom, mm -hmm. that they can be like, oh, there's different ways that I can be in my activism that doesn't only have to look one way. And so that was really the start of how I got into documentary filmmaking. Okay, like okay. And I know you've got a project called Honor Black Trans Women. You've got I Am, We Are Here, talking about LGBTQ people in people of color in the Bronx, which I love. I, I taught in the South Bronx for a little while. Ooh. Yes, yes. Can you talk about those two projects? And so did those come out of you learning from that documentary film program? I will say so, and then a little differently, because it's, I did that in Minnesota, and then I went back to New York to really look okay. at building my career yeah. as a filmmaker. Ended up in an MFA program, and not, I had to do other things to pay the bills, mm -hmm. as you know. Mm -hmm. And so I couldn't do filmmaking the way that I wanted to. Yeah. And so after running a nonprofit, also in the South Bronx, and looking at, okay, how can I get back to making sure activism is at the front of what I do. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, let me make sure I, I be active as a filmmaker again and use that as a tool. And so when I did I Am, I really wanted people to know that there are people who are thriving, who are their full selves, yes. who are having joy. Yes. yes, there's white supremacy, there's homophobia, there's transphobia and patriarchy, right? All those things exist. However, that is not the sum of our identity. Mm. And with I am, I wanted people to see people being like happy and talking about what joy looks like. And so I filmed that as part of Bronx Pride. I know I needed it and other people needed it because it was just constant death that we were hearing. And then it was also a different way of me making films because I was using photography and it became multimedia, mm, right? Okay. And then really started getting into more of the lyrical style of how I just uh, create my work. And then it was a couple years later that I did Honor um, Black Trans Women. Unfortunately, there was another murder that took place in New York mm -hmm. and it was having a vigil to look at like, how do we honor people and what it, would it look like? We honored Black trans folks. Right. And instead of like the violence that happens to us, let's honor people and put them at the center mm -hmm. and look at ritual because ritual is also part of our organizing. And so that's where that um, documentary came out of in 2019. I think Beautiful. That was. Yeah. And then, of course, you started to get more recognition from your work. I'd love for you to talk about what you developed as part of Sundance and then what you're working on now. You sent me a lovely clip from Afro Mystic, the current project you're working on. I feel like sometimes when we talk to gender expansive people, our guests on the show, on one hand, it feels like there are blooming possibilities. There's more and more acceptance and visibility. And at the same time, we've been here. Afro Mystic really is touching on that, right? There's a whole long, long history. Mm. With Sundance, the Trans Possibility Fellowship, it was an opportunity to, for me to continue to work on Afro Mystic because it's been a work in progress. Mm -hmm. And what was great is that they really had us with some industry folks who were either trans masculine folks, trans women, or gender expansive folks, mm -hmm. and had us come together as a group to talk about our work and to talk about that space of like authenticity and accountability when we're making these works, especially as folks or gender diverse folks, right? And it was also an opportunity to hear some of the, the challenges that people go through, but how they've been able to find solutions. Mm -hmm. And so I found that it was really a nurturing space and it was important. You know what I mean? Because what I had been experiencing is that with Afro Mystic, which is basically queer and trans storytelling, 
in the United States, in Nigeria, and Brazil. Yes. And it's my first feature length film. And it's lyrical, it has animation in it. And I just was experiencing a lot of no's. Mm -hmm. And the opportunity with Sundance to be part of that fellowship helped for us to have those conversations of how do we just continue to have confidence in ourselves and to do this work that's so much needed. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so that's the things that I've been like workshopping and continuing to build off. And also really, if I step back, the core of my work is really around community making and, and upload, uh, upholding community and really looking at like how there's like space for us. And, and as part of the work that I do, especially with Afromystic, is that it's telling this very African story, this very black story, this very brown story, yes. right, from people who are of these spiritualities and who are queer, who are trans, who are gender diverse, and also having me as a director tell that story, mm. right? Because even though there's been more opportunities for there to be trans directors or gender expansive folks, we still continue to see a lot of people of whiteness leading that charge. Absolutely. Not Getting I mean, the resources, leading the charge, all of that. Yes, yes. You know what I mean? And so we talked through some of that at the Trans Fellowship. And also as I looked at how I'm just making sure that I continue to do this work. Because for me, I was like, it's important for this, to, this work to happen regardless of the recognition. You know what I mean? And that's Ooh, where I come back to community. Brunch. That, 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 that's <laughs> us. <laughs> Five seasons you know in I mean? and we just call ourselves the little podcast that could. Absolutely. Because, yeah, yeah, you keep doing the work no matter what. Because yeah. community matters. And because they haven't recognized the value, the, the gatekeepers, because this is not their experience. Or at least they have not been able to recognize it as part of their experience. <laughs> right? Peace, this is Shayi at a banjo, and you're listening to Sister Brunch. You're listening to Sister Brunch, the podcast by and about Black women and gender expansive people thriving in entertainment and media. We'll be right back with more of our conversation with queer, gender nonconforming Nigerian artist Shayi at a banjo. We're back, and we're so excited to share more of our conversation with Shayi. Spirituality is such a big part of your work. Can you talk about why that is, how it drives you, and even define some of the spirituality for us that is specific to your work? At the core of what I've always been doing is building spirituality and social justice. Mm. And maybe saying it's a reclamation comes to mind, mm. right? Because if we think about our indigenous cultures from wherever we are in the world that we're indigenous to, mm. we've always had spirituality and it's always been a practice to organize and create our communities, yes. right? It's like really like that Western lens that has to separate the two. That's, you can't be an organizer and spiritual mm -hmm. at the same time, mm -hmm. right? You think about the Haitian Rebellion. Yes. They, had, they yes. had a ritual and they had been organizing through ritual yes. to be able to do that, you know what I mean? And it's just been at the heart of what I do because that's just how we are as human beings. And especially with Afro Mystic, I wanted to remind people and to also flip the conversation that as people who are African or who are traditionalists from West Africa, right, or West African Yoruba spirituality, my practice, that there's always been space for us within Orisha culture or Isheshe, as some people say. Will you describe that a little bit more? What is Orisha culture and Yoruba also? I can do that. So Yoruba culture is three things. A language, yeah. it's an ethnic group, and it's a spiritual practice. Okay. So. It's those things simultaneously. Like being gender expansive, like being Nigerian and black and in the Bronx and in Minnesota. And, uh -huh, uh -huh. Yes. <laughs> you know All these saying, things right? simultaneously. Yes. Right. Yes. And that's really important because you can't take the spirituality out of the culture. Some people have different words for it in terms of being like you're a traditionalist coming out of Nigeria or Yoruba land, which is in the southwest of Nigeria okay. on the west coast of the African continent. Mm -hmm. Some people say West African Orisha practice, right? Or Yoruba spirituality mm -hmm. is another way of saying it. Or another way of saying it is that it's Isheshe, 
which is like part of a cultural, spiritual, or religious community. And those identities specifically come out of West Africa or Nigeria particularly. And then you look at how Orisha expanded because of the transatlantic slave trade. And so you have Conan Blay in Brazil, which I got to yes. this year. I can talk more about that yes. in a second. Yes. So it, it, it translated that way. And you also have West African Orisha practitioners in Bahia, Brazil, too. Right. 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 <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Yes. So that was exciting yes. because you have those things that exist at the same time mm -hmm. in Brazil, mm -hmm. right? And then I've also been interviewing some folks who come out of Cuba. Mm -hmm. And in Cuba, you have the syncretism of West African Orisha practice with Catholicism. And it's called Lukumi. And so that comes out of Cuba. There's a lot of practitioners in the U.S. who practice Lukumi. So that's like a basic of like when I talk about Yoruba spirituality or Lukumi or Kondomble, those are the three parts of the, the continent that I'm looking at. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So what are you finding as you're developing Afromystic and focusing on Brazil and also Cuba? At the root of Afromystic is really flipping that dialogue or that script that there is in places for people of the African descent practicing these African technologies. Having people who look like me be on camera and talk about how faith leads them, right, in their leadership and who they are as a queer or trans or gender expansive person. And so those have been important things to capture, to really have a different conversation than what we see mainstream media yes. saying, yes. you know what I mean? Yes. And so when we went to Brazil, which has been like, a, I don't want to say a lifelong, but it's been like many moons coming of being excited and wanting to get to Bahia for many reasons, not just the culture, the food, and also thinking it has the largest descendants of Yoruba people outside of Yoruba oh, in, in, in Bahia, and, and specifically in Bahia, right? Yeah. So you have this very African culture yes. that's not just like Yoruba folks, but other African identities there. And so it's really important to get there. And so when we got there, we were able to see people who did practice traditional Yoruba spirituality there. So that was beautiful to see. Mm -hmm. And then we also interviewed folks in Condomble and specifically the Conan Blade that's mixed with some indigenous practices and also mixed with some West African practice, right? Mm -hmm. I learned like there's diff three different types of Conan Blade, okay. Conan Blade from the Congo, Jeji, and there's Angola, you oh, know what I mean? Yes, yes. And so I'm learning all these things through research and it just was really wonderful to see how people were able to talk about who they are in their practice and how their Conan Blade temples know who they are, mm. right? Whether they will use the word queer or trans or gender expansive all the time, they show up in their full selves mm. and their houses support that. So we were able to document some of that. And then we were also able to document some people who like, some of these homes or these houses, these temples in Bahia, not that they are necessarily discriminating, they just haven't had public statements. Okay. Saying where they stand when it comes to like queer and gender expansive folks mm -hmm. and people really pushing back to say what's happening, right? Are you for us in some of these temples or do we have to start our own? Mm -hmm. And so you see some of the old school temples having to figure out how they're going to make public statements even though they're already doing the work. Right. And so there's that mix of that, right? right? And also there's the mix of the temples who are like, you're gay, you're queer, get out of here, right? That also exists. I'm not saying it's perfect. Yeah. So you have all these things happening. We were able to like see that in different parts of Bahia and capture that. Yes. And then what was really exciting as we got to Brazil is that it was the 100 year anniversary of the Iyama Job Festival, right? What's that? And listen, so <laughs> she's beautiful, right? So it's... It, Oh, so there's like very many complications. So that's why I go, ah, because Yamaja in Nigeria or Yoruba land is a river deity. Mm -hmm. And so when she went over to Brazil, in some parts, she became the ocean. And there's different stories on how she became the ocean. Uh, and is Yamaya part of Yoruba or part of Condomble or all of the above or a separate deity? All of the above. Okay. But then that's where it becomes the complexity of there still is in Bahia people who honor her as the river. 
Hey family, it's Fanchon and you're listening to Sister Brunch. We'll be right back. And during this quick break, if you haven't done this already, you know the drill. You know what I'm going to ask you. Go ahead and head over to Instagram and follow us there at Sister Brunch Podcast. Because in Yoruba land, she's, she's the, river the river deity. Okay. However, at the 100th anniversary of the Iyamaja Festival, she's celebrated as the ocean also. Right, and so both rituals happen simultaneously. You stop it with weekend. all of these. You keep forcing all of us to be like, it's multi layered. <laughs> That's all. You know all your mean? work is right? it's multi layered. It is not binary. It is not singular. Yeah. It is not essentialist. All of this is ourselves, our beings are multi layered. And we need liberatory practices so that all of us can live all of these multi-layers there's no reason why we should try to put a barrier up for somebody else to live those layers and by not doing that we get to live our own all our own which is what it's about right as we liberate ourselves and others the whole world becomes liberated shay what is your approach to the barriers especially and i'm and i'm asking on a personal level too because this work is hard trying to get funding, trying to get support, feeling like we have to even justify our existence. And then to do that in film and television, because to your point, so we make it accessible so that young people especially can see it and go, oh, oh, that is me. I get to live liberatory life already because this person's doing that, right? But how do you stay (laughs) spiritual and loving (laughs) and grounded when sometimes you want to cuss people out? At least I do sometimes. (laughs) It's both end, Mm -hmm. right? Because I am also a human being, right? right? I'm I'm a special person and I'm a human being. And so lots of it is like many moments of having to breathe because people are bringing in their perspective of their worldview or their homophobia and violence. Mm. And then there's other times when maybe I'll educate, but not to everyone. Mm. And for me to really stay grounded, part of it is making sure I'm doing my spiritual practices. You know what I mean? Which I'm human, so I fall out of too. Mm -hmm. And then the other part is just making sure I stay connected to the people that love me and being really intentional Mm. that... I have a specific set of people. There's three of them (laughs) that I know are like my best friends Mm -hmm. that I reach out to. And that helps me because it is really challenging or isolating. And then also knowing that the work that I do is important and that it has to get done. And I'll give you this example of like, my again, I'm in Brazil, never been to this country ever in my life. We're at this festival, the Yemeja festival. Hundreds of thousands of people are there. And out of nowhere, this person is, hey, I know you. And I'm like, maybe you saw me on YouTube, but yes, I don't know. Yes. I'm not My funky, Lavender right? Magazine cover from back in the... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <Yeah. laughs> right? You know what I'm saying? And so then they're like, oh, you did a film about Nigeria and your grandmothers. And I was like, oh, my great grandmother, because I had done another documentary, which is at the foundation of this queer and Orisha storytelling called oh yeah something happened on the way to west africa yes oh yeah document yes. going back home yes. to my great grandmother and the practice and being queer and gender expansive and yes. that has gotten all over the place right and it got to this person who lived in germany and was part of a, a screening committee to bring my film to germany oh, right my. so that the black and queer and trans yes. folks could see yes it. yes <laughs> Right? Yeah. So that's one of the ways where it helps me not that stay could, That could minded. give that to you for a good year when that kind of thing happens. You know, You're like, you know what? You can live yeah. off of that kind of energy and experience and acknowledgement yeah. of the importance of your work. Ultimately, uh, that is the thing that keeps us going. Absolutely. Because that is why we're doing the work, as you said. Oh, my goodness. I'm so glad to know you. Okay, we... I'm glad to know you too. We're going to get to our signature Sister Brunch questions, which is that you and young Shay are sitting down for a Sister Brunch or a sibling brunch. And uh, we want to know what are you both eating? What are you both drinking? And what do you tell them? Hmm. Me and little Shay, 
we are eating pounded jam, mm. <laughs> right? We're eating some effa viva, <laughs> right? There's some goat <laughs> there and some plantains. Yes. So that's what we're eating yes. while we're eating your bar food. Mm. And, and I think we're just like sitting at a table. And so what my adult Shayi is saying to my younger Shayi or my inner child is to remember to believe in myself. Remember mm-hmm. to believe in you and to keep going because there will be many people who want to invalidate you. There will be a violence that happens in this world and to you. And those things will want to say that you don't have the right to believe in yourself and be. And I'm here to tell you, little Shayi, believe in yourself and keep going. You're going to have so many successes that are unexpected, right? Keep going, keep going, keep going, because it's about community, it's about you. Keep going. That's what I have to tell to to little Shayi. And also to enjoy this food and eat all the time. <laughs> Even when you're stressed, eat that pound again. Because you're not going to be able to find that in a lot of places where you go in the world. So eat it while it's in front of you, too. <laughs> We wish you nothing but abundance and we'll make sure we continue to support your work. It's so important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh my goodness, you all, I love doing these so much. What an absolute privilege to get to speak to and learn from our amazing guests. I know you are as impressed with them and inspired by them as I am. Please be sure to find them on their socials. Head over to our Instagram and find them there. We'll also be highlighting them in our newsletters weekly during the regular season and monthly during our hiatus. Please follow them and support their work and if you reach out to them which you should as well let them know that you heard this conversation with them on sister brunch a reminder that you can read the transcript of every single episode and sign up for our newsletter on our website sisterbrunch.com if you want to see our faces you can watch the full videos on the trujillo youtube channel youtube.com slash trujillo media t-r-u-j-u-l-o media and we are really truly so grateful for your support by subscribing to our podcast leaving us a great review sharing it with your friends family colleagues community we appreciate you so much Season five of Sister Brunch is brought to you by Trujillo Productions. Our show creators are me, Fanton Cox, Anya Adams, Christabel Nsiabwadi, and Brittany Turner. Sister Brunch is a Women Make Movies production assistance program project. We acknowledge that the land we record our podcast on is the original land of the Tongva and the Chumash people. That's for me, Fanton, in Los Angeles. We cannot wait to see you next time. Take care, everybody.